Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, whether here or online, it's great to see you. And we have a special day today, partly because uh, Pastor Round and his family are, are on a trip, and so we can be praying for them to have a great time together. And because of that, we get the treat of having Dr. Beely speak to us today from God's Word as we continue in Matthew. Um, as we get started, I want to point out the connection cards that are in your bulletin. Whether you've been here for years or it's your first time here, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, you might have a prayer need that you'd like to share with us. You might like to uh, ask about an activity that we have coming up or sign up for something. So it's important to, to hear from you. We, uh, we have the elders and prayer team who pray for you. And uh, if you have questions, we'd love to hear from you so we can be in contact with you. So keep that in mind today. Um, today, our, in our passage in Matthew, we consider the crucifixion of Christ, where he willingly died in our place. And uh, he took our sin and our punishment, and uh, that we might be redeemed and be right with God. Let's stand as we read Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Let's stand as we read. And as we do this, let's consider the humility of Christ. Verse 5, having this mind among yourselves, which is, in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in that name, at that name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let's pray. Father, we come today thankful, thankful that you took our place, that you redeemed us through your shed blood on the cross. We're thankful for your grace and mercy that we depend on every day, not only for our salvation, but to live for you and to love you more. Father, we thank you for that love and wisdom that you apply by your great power to our lives intimately every day. So today as we sing and worship and through song and through hearing the word, we pray that uh, you'd help us to see you better, to love you more, and to be thankful from the deepest part of our hearts. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm looking forward to worshiping together with you. Sing.
would rescue me from my failure. Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Only my holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry now, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face wounds that mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking you did at the cross, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would stop and worship you and glorify you for who you are, for your kindness, your goodness, and your mercy. And Lord, also that it would stop us, that we would realize our need to confess and lay our lives before you and to bring our sin before you. For you, Lord, take it away. And Lord, that it would stop us to give thanks 
Thanks, God, that you are good and that because of what you have done, we have life in Jesus. We have eternal life and we praise you. Lord, may you be glorified today and we do thank you for the cross and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, my name is Carrie, and I want to talk to you today about something exciting that's going to be happening here at Chapel City. We are going to be offering our mom to mom group. Um, we are going to both have a morning session and an evening session. And I wanted to tell you from my heart uh, why mom to mom is so important for me. Um, when I was 15, my mom had passed away with cancer. And one of the things I had prayed for was that the Lord would bring strong Christian women into my life uh, to help me along the way, to help um, guide me and answer questions that I have by using the Bible or just being a friend that would pray. And um, at Mom to Moms, I feel like I have met that group of women again. There are all different ages. There's moms who have children who are infants all the way up to high schoolers. And it's so neat to be able to share and know what I share or know what they share will be confidential, that they will pray with you, that they will hug you. Um, we get to enjoy food together and fellowship. Um, it is just a wonderful, wonderful time to come. We're going to have some great speakers that we have lined up that will share with us how to be um, a better mom, how to be a better wife, um, how to serve others in our community, and just to get closer to the Lord. Um, I want to encourage you to come. Don't let what you're wearing stop you from coming or find an excuse that you're so tired you can't go. Um, make an effort to come and meet some great moms and know that you will actually feel better after you leave knowing that um, you came and had a great time. So I just want to again encourage you, all the details will be in our bulletin or you can go to our website and look online. Um, right now we're having registration. It's open to all the moms. Um, there will be childcare in the morning for um, our homeschoolers and also for our infants and preschoolers. If you have um, a financial struggle, don't let that stop you from coming. We'll have some scholarships available too. So I hope that answered your questions. If you have any more, please feel free to stop me and ask me or any of the other moms who are on the committee. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, thank you. So um, good morning, and I am here. I have a few announcements as there's a lot going on as we're starting into the new you know, school year time, but specifically, um, I am here to represent Awana. So um, first of all, before I start, how many people have participated in Awana as a student? So whether you're six years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, 40 years old, how many people have participated as a student? So a good number. How many participated as a leader? Whoa, wow, even more leaders than students. That's incredible. So uh, what I want to tell you is what Awana is. I want to tell you um, what some of the distinctives are and what you can do um, in regard to that. So Awana is an evangelism and discipleship program for kids. And at, at this church, we do um, preschool up through sixth grade. And what a couple of distinctives about Awana is, first of all, it in terms of a discipleship and evangelism thing, there's really three distinctives here. There's discipleship, and this is maybe the key part of Awana. In each student has a handbook, and the key part of the handbooks is it's pretty much memorizing Bible verses. There's some other activities and things like that, but it's got Bible verses. And the exciting thing about it for me is that it provides a structure for parents or grandparents or neighbors or whoever is working with the kids to go through and memorize Bible verses. When I was a young father, um, I had this great ambition of all these things I was going to do with my kids, including memorizing Bible verses. And honestly, I know myself well enough to know that if I didn't have this kind of structure, I wouldn't really have followed through. And you can ask them about the other things that I've not followed through on. So it, from a discipleship perspective, it's really valuable um, for parents that I experienced as well. Um, of course, also, it's a teaching program as well. We have teaching and singing, and it's, um, in fact, the night is split into these three areas. We have the handbook time where the kids, 
you know, sit at tables and say the verses back. But there is a teaching time where we really worship. We sing, and then we hear from the Word of God. And the, the main focus, there's all sorts of, we're teaching the Bible, but the main focus is in the area of trusting the Bible and knowing the gospel. And that's, those are kind of some of the distinctives in terms of our teaching. And then finally, it's kind of a bonding experience. One of our goals as we do Awana is um, included with discipleship, included with evangelism, included with the teaching, is to let kids know it's a, church is a fun place to come. It's our goal that as they grow up, we don't know how the Lord is going to use Awana. Some kids can be saved at a very young age. Others are kind of packing in this information that the Spirit, when he wakens their hearts, all of this stuff is packed in there. And now all of a sudden, if they know who Abraham is, they know who David is, and they know who the Lord Jesus is, the lights come on and all of this background information kind of bursts forth. And it's kind of a, a great joy to see that kind of thing. So what we do on a typical night, it's basically it's an hour and a half each Wednesday night for the school year. So that, that's when it is. It's 6.15 to 6.45. And what can you do? So as a church, first I would ask you to pray and I want you to be encouraged that this kind of ministry is going on. This is not just for our kids. In fact, so far we've got about 30 kids signed up and maybe like 40% are from our church and the rest are from other churches, you know, in the area. So we are doing a service for other churches as they raise their children. And then also, um, especially during the year, kids invite neighbors and, you know, people. And so we have a few kids also that don't belong to a church at all and it's their introduction um, to the Lord Jesus. So pr please pray and also just please know that this is going on. Second of all, please sign up your kids. Just go to um, chapelcity.church slash Awana and you can sign up. Um, I know, like, like I said, we have more people outside the church than in the church. That might be because of our habit. Or maybe I should say tradition of signing up late for things, hit <laughs> the deadline. We don't even have a deadline, but please sign up so we can make sure that we have materials for your kids. Kids, grandkids, even invite neighbor kids. And then finally, if you're interested in helping weekly, especially in our um, third to sixth grade group, we could use probably at least a male and female leader. So if you're interested at all, find one of the people that raised their hands, find me, and we would love to have you join us. It is a blessing. It's a little bit like having church in the middle of the week. So if one day of church isn't enough, come to Awana and you get two days of church. All right, briefly, I want to, um, a few other announcements. Um, ushers, as we start up, we're going to go back inside, not next week, but the week after. So we have our two, um, two services starting September 4th. Fourth. Yes, that's correct. And we have more of a need for people to help with ushers. So what ushers do is, of course, they meet you um, as you come in. But one of the things, like having plenty of ushers and backup, is to help people you know, answer questions, lead them to the nursery, lead them to a Sunday school class, things like that. And we can't do that if there's only one or two people that are you know, handing out um, flyers and that sort of thing. So we would encourage you, if you're interested in helping with the ushers, um, find one of them after service. High schoolers, I would encourage you. I know after camp there was encouragement to find a way to serve in the church. It's a great way to serve. So if you're interested in helping as an usher, please do that. Um, next, um, let's see, in a couple of weeks, there is a church information or new members class on September 11th at 6 p.m. in the overflow room. If you want to find out more about what we do as a church or and if you want to pursue church membership, please come to this class on September 11th at 6 p.m. Um, like I said, not next week, but the week after, we're back to two services. So an 8.30 service and a, an 11 o'clock service. And that we are going to be starting up Sunday school. So there's a flyer in here that says what the new fall schedule is. There should be no confusion. There will be Sunday school classes as well. So I encourage you to check out what those are and choose one and come participate with us. Those are going to be at 10 o'clock every week. Next week after church, there is a family picnic. So 11.30 at Valley Lindo Park. I know Pastor Matt says Valle Lindo, but I, I don't know. I've always said Valley Lindo. So next week after church, 11.30 at Valley Lindo Park, we're going to have food and games and fun. So it'll be our kind of our last summer, closing the summer event. And then finally, um, after service this week is a men's ministry meeting. If you have ideas, if you want your voice to be heard, if you'd like to know how you can participate in men's ministry, I would encourage you to join the group of men that are going to be meeting to discuss how might men's ministry look at this church going forward? And so with that, I'd like to welcome up Greg to teach us and exhort us. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. And for you guys going to Israel, Boker Tov. Get you, get you going here on this a little bit. Um, it's always good to fill in for Matt. I'm happy to help him any chance I can get, take a little bit of load off of his plate. Um, before I start, I have just a couple of quick announcements of my own. 
Uh, number one, those of you that are going to Israel with us in October, uh, be aware we sent out a letter from the IBEX office yesterday uh, that will be coming to you regarding payment information, departure information. Uh, I'd encourage you to read that, to just be aware of a come, upcoming deadline on, on that, all right? And uh, be looking for that. We did get your field notebooks in. Um, we will be giving those to you that are going on the uh, class, so you can begin using those. And I'll explain more about those during the class. Uh, also, I just wanted to add, uh, last week we sent off our seniors to uh, college. Uh, they're getting settled into their classes, going through their orientation processes at their different universities. Um, I want to encourage you to continue praying for them. Uh, I think particularly of the kids going off to secular universities who are going to be facing not only uh, competing worldviews, but hostile worldviews. They're going to have to find good church homes possibly, maybe a campus ministry they could get plugged in. So don't forget those kids. And certainly... If I can be a little selfish here, remember the professors. You know, we, uh, we have challenges teaching Gen Z. It's a whole different uh, ball game today in higher education. And so we appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your prayers. I'll be dealing with approximately 200 new students and classes a week from tomorrow. Um, and uh, they don't know what's going to hit them. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. You know, this week is like camp. Well, camp is over and you're mine now. <laughs> So do pray for us. I know I appreciate it. My colleagues appreciate it as uh, we move forward. And, of course, kids scattered around the United States going to different schools. Do, don't forget to pray for them. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to open us with a word of prayer and then introduce a very familiar subject to all of us, um, almost too familiar in some ways, and talk about that with you. So let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, as we open your word to a very famous passage of Scripture, I would ask that you would open our eyes, that you would show us wonderful things from your word, that, Father, we would leave here not only uh, enlightened, but refreshed, and certainly challenged in our faith. Uh, Father, please use my words, use your word to impact this church for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We just pray for Matt and Brandy that you would refresh them, give them time to enjoy themselves. In Christ's name, amen. When Matt asked me to speak for him, uh, we're, we've been working through Matthew, obviously, for several years now. And I, I, uh, I was thinking, you know, when we came to this section, we, we're, we're introducing the crucifixion. And obviously, that's kind of an important part of the book. And uh, I said to Matt, when he asked if I could speak today, I said, well, do you, do you want me to do a one-off so you can do the crucifixion? That's kind of a big thing. You know, it's like, you're the pastor, man. You ought to be able to do this. And he says, no, 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 you do it, you do it. And I'm thinking, I, I don't know. It's kind of, I feel guilty taking it from you. It's like everything builds to this. And, uh, but Matt said, no, I want to do it. I think he's got a little bit of barn sour, you know, wanting to push to the end of Matthew and get through it here soon. So I said, well, I'm happy to do it. You know, if you want me to do a one-off, I'm happy to do that too. You just tell me, I'll do it. You just let me know. And he said, no, keep us going through the crucifixion. Now, when we come to the crucifixion, there's probably nothing more familiar to us as followers of Jesus Christ. You know, we attend Good Friday services, and maybe you came in, you looked at this, and immediately you flush into your mind, oh boy, here comes a Good Friday service. Uh, I want to think about this differently. We have had 2,000 years to get comfortable with the idea of the cross. And I want to go back and help us rethink how we see the crucifixion of Christ. Now, let me illustrate this way. Some of you have, right now, you're wearing jewelry that has a cross around your neck. You might have a tattoo that has a cross on you. You could certainly walk into our, our main uh, building over here. We'll be doing this a couple of weeks. If you look up, you'll see a cross behind where the baptism, bat, uh, baptistry is up there. Now, let's suppose for a moment, think about this, that in two weeks you come in, we're back meeting together in the main, main building, and you walk in there, and up front, the cross is down, but up front is a guillotine. Now, you probably think, that's messed up. A guillotine? Well, that's what the cross is. It's a method of execution. In fact, it is interesting that the guillotine was designed to be merciful and quick 
as opposed to the cross. It's interesting that the early church didn't use the cross as a symbol. If you know your church history, the earliest Christians used the sign of the fish. Now, I'm going to try this, see if I can get this thing to work. All right. I give up. <laughs> Point it this way, pointing at you. Yeah, maybe I'm too far. I love technology. Ha! There we go. Well, for you that are watching online, you're having fun with this, like us. Ah, there we go. All right. Yeah, I always think, how much more effective Jesus would have been if he had technology? Right? All right, so we're familiar with the sign of the fish, and it's interesting, the word fish in Greek is actually a creedal acrostic. It stands for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And the early church followed that. They did not use the cross. Why? Because the cross was such a horrific form of execution that it was sort of vile to them. They didn't use it. Later on, it would become a symbol. And today, we use it as a symbol everywhere, whether it's jewelry, whether it's in our church, whether it's on a bulletin, whatever it would be. Now, what I want us to do is to understand a little bit of what crucifixion is. We'll kind of put this in the context of Matthew and kind of walk us through this. Now, I have a very simple outline here, just two points. Uh, we're going to look at the readiness for the crucifixion. Now, last week, Pastor Matt took us through, in an abbreviated format, the Roman trial with Pilate. Now, there's a lot more that we could talk about. There's, a, I mean, the stuff that I will talk about with you today, entire college and seminary courses are taught on this subject. Um, Matthew gives us sort of an abridged version of this, the Reader's Digest version of it. It's quicker. Um, but certainly, coming out of the trials, Pilate, and we see this, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 27, or scroll up in your your electronic device, to Matthew 27. At the end of the trial, this is where Matt left us last Sunday, Matthew 27, uh, 27, verse 26, then he released Barabbas. By the way, I think there's a little irony in that name. Barabbas in Aramaic means son of the father. They released the son of the father to crucify the true son of the father. So, Barabbas is released, and, but having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now, at this point, we move into the crucifixion narrative. We begin in chapter 27. But to do that, I'd like to just, and you know me, I, I like pictures. I'm a visual kind of person. I like to show people things that we can, kind of walk you through a little bit about the crucifixion. Now, when we get into the text, the majority of what we're going to talk about this morning in Matthew 27 focuses on the first three hours of the crucifixion. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. Now, the trials, when Matt was talking about this last week, this is a model in Jerusalem. It's a 1 to 50 scale. Um, it depicts the palace area where Pilate would have had his residence and probably Herod Antipas. If you remember what Matt said during the trials, uh, Pilate would interview Jesus. He hears that Herod is in town. He's probably in the same palace area in a different part of it. Uh, he will send Jesus over to Herod Antipas for this brief interview. Uh, it doesn't last long before Herod Antipas kicks. You remember what Matt said about this? Kicks Jesus back to him to do that. So it's all happening in this complex that was created by Herod the Great. Okay, it sits on the west side of Jerusalem. A uh, very important fortified structure. It's going to factor into our story. As you look at that, you see the courtyard areas. Get that visually in your mind. Because Jesus is going to be, in verse 27, brought back into the praetorium, the residence, for what will be coming. All right? So this is where the trials would occur, particularly the trial with Pilate and the trial with Herod Antipas, who had heard about this famous itinerant preacher in the territories that he was in charge of. Now, moving from there, I get asked, and I know we've got a church of readers here, so I often get asked, well, what's the best book on the crucifixion? Read this one, Martin Hengel. 
Uh, I'll occasionally hear somebody do a message or write a book, and it's about the cross or the crucifixion. People go, man, that's, where did they get that? That's great. Ah, they're just stealing from Hingle. All right? I like to go right to the headwater of everything. So I would recommend, if you want to ever study this on your own, it's a whole history of crucifixion. Folks, the Romans did not invent crucifixion, but they certainly perfected it, almost to an art form. And so Hengel will help you understand that. So for those of you that are, you know, do a little extra reading, or you're looking for something to read on the flight to Israel, here you go. Read Martin Hengel, okay? Now, let me walk you through crucifixion. Okay, let's understand this. When a person was crucified, there would be a series of stages, and we see this in the gospel accounts, all right, where they would typically be, be beaten, caned, made sport of. Now, we see this. For example, uh, if you look at verse, and I'll come back to this, look at verse 30 of chapter uh, 27. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. It was very common in crucifixion when the accused was brought in and ready to be, be crucified that they would be beaten with some kind of rod or cane. That was to get it started. Now, it, if we understand the sequence of Jesus' crucifixion, it's slightly altered here. In fact, it says back in verse 26, he was scourged. So the victim would be beaten with the cane, made sport of. Typically, that was part of this process. Then they would be scourged. Now, folks, this itself was horrific. If any of you saw the movie, and I don't recommend it at all, uh, the uh, Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, you saw this. The victim would be brought to what was called a flagrum pole. Now, this is sort of a picture of this. Be tied to this pole. They would usually be stripped. So one of my friends would say, naked, you know. Then the Roman legionnaire would have a device called a flagrum, which was a, it was a rod about this long, wood, on that rod was a series of leather straps that would come off, and in the end of those straps was embedded sharp metal, glass, or bone. What the legionnaire would do would take this thing, and it would rake it across the back of the victim. So when he did this, don't think of it as Indiana Jones with the bullwhip, folks. He would take this thing and literally drive it, use all of his force, drive it into the back of the victim, embedding this into the flesh, and then rake the back with it, strip the back. Now, this was so cruel, the Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy talks about this, limited the number that you did because this itself could kill the victim, and that was not the intent. The cross is what will kill you. So they would lay this across the person's back, weakening them for crucifixion. This itself, folks, was horrifically painful. And the victim would go through this before moving off to the cross itself. Now, when we think of the cross, we tend to think of our nice, polished, symbolic little crosses. There, we really don't know uh, what Jesus' cross looked like. There's no depiction of it by the eyewitnesses. Um, the Romans used all kinds of styles. Here's three styles that are replications in Israel that, that depict this. Most of them were not a polished wood cross. They just needed, they just needed something to stick you up on. Uh, they could be in the form of a T. They could be form of the traditional cross that we think of. They occasionally did an X if they had that. All they needed was something to put you up on. All right? Now, when the person went up on the cross, folks, and please listen to this. When they went up on a cross, Typically, they would have nails that were oftentimes, think of them more like railroad spikes, not nails, like a roofing nail, that would be driven into the wrist area. Now, most of you know there are a lot of nerves in this area, so you can imagine having that driven right through those nerves into the wood to hang you on the cross. Then the victim, and there's several different ways archaeologically they've seen this, the person's feet would be also nailed to the cross. There are a couple different ways they did it. One way is they would cross the legs, and we have archaeological evidence of this. They would cross the legs and then drive one, le one nail through both legs. Another way they did this, and you can imagine how this would feel, is they would take the person's heels, 
put their heels against the cross, and then drive the nail through the heel areas on both sides. Now, you can imagine what that feels like. The purpose of the cross, the purpose of crucifixion, was to inflict maximum amount of pain and an agonizingly slow death. That was the point of this. The Romans wanted to make a point. You mess with Rome, this is what's going to happen. So the person would be nailed up on one of these crosses. Now I give you here a depiction of it. Okay, carrying the cross beam here, sometimes that would happen. There were different ways that they have found this. You see this individual in kind of an open pose, uh, nailed up. They would often have a little kind of a piece of wood the person could sort of sit on. But don't think of it as, it's kind of like, the way I think of that seat is coach in most airlines. <laughs> no, I'm just joking on that. Um, but it, it was not designed for comfort, just kind of support them up there so the nails didn't rip out of their hands or their feet. They might be in this kind of a form, okay? And sometimes in this kind of a form, where you can see how it nails through the ankle areas into the wood. Now, the point of this, folks, is that in the crucifixion, this person has undergone severe trauma to the back area of the flesh, the muscle, being ripped with the scourging process. Now they're being put up onto this wood structure. You can imagine the rawness of the back on this, the excruciating pain in the na nail areas, and they'd be left to die. Now, I could, I, I don't want to put you all into a coma out here, um, but when the person was up on the cross, usually death could take many, many days, and people would die of different things. You could die of commonly pneumonia, the lungs begin filling with liquid that was common, heart failure certainly from trauma would, would kill them, uh, dehydration would kill them. It's interesting that Jesus even says, I thirst. Um, oftentimes, hypothermia would kill them. This time of year when Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, nighttime temperatures in Jerusalem are in the 30s. And hypothermia could take the life. So typically the idea was when a person went up on the cross, they were going to linger for a while before. And death, folks, death would be welcome. You, you go up on a cross... A Roman cross, there is only one way you're coming down, and that's dead. Now, with all of that in view here, folks, okay, and by the way, just to show this, um, I like to occasionally kind of help with maps and everything. You know, people sometimes say, how far were the distances? They're not very far. The whole crucifixion, the trials of Jesus, and you really can't see it very well here. You can look up on the monitors or see it here. Uh, the Jewish trial with Caiaphas and the high priest, the Sanhedrin, would happen very close to the Herodian palace. You can see the Roman trial area was inside. And I can actually take some of you guys that are going with us to Israel. I'll show you where this was. Uh, in the Herodian palace area. And then Golgotha, which we'll talk about in a few moments, was probably only about a five to ten minute walk away. All of this is in a very tight space. We're only talking about maybe uh, less than a quarter mile distance, probably much even less than that. So it was all in a very, all this is happening. So how this happened so fast overnight, it's all in a very compact area. It's very close, all right? And again, sort of a model here that we see where the red arrow is. That's about where Jesus was crucified relative to the temple. The Herodian palace is in the bottom right corner here. Uh, that's where he would have been. You see a gate area near where that red arrow is pointing. That's probably a gate where people were passing through. It was important that crucifixion happened where people were walking by and saw it. Rome wanted to make a point. You mess with Rome, this is what happens. Don't mess with Rome. All right? Now, and again, this is hard to see here. The, the charcoal dome building here, that's where that is today. This is the modern city of Jerusalem looking from the Mount of Olives, and you can see where that would have been by this charcoal dome that oversees the church on that site. Uh, this is archaeological evidence of crucifixion. It's been found in Israel. This is a person who, uh, the, they couldn't get the nail out of the victim, so they buried him with the nail in. And this was found in a bone box, what's called an ossuary in Jerusalem, uh, as evidence. Now in the Israel Museum, you can actually see it there. All right, so let's go to the text. I think that's why we're here, right? <laughs> It's like my friend Doug Bookman says, I build a large porch for a small house. 
But let's go to the text. Now look at it with me. Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor, and this is a reference to Pilate, took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Now, a couple things about verse 27, folks. This is the praetorium. This is the residence of the governor, the procurator. He goes by different names. This is Pilate. Uh, he can be called a procurator, a prefect, a governor. Those are all terms for his office. He is basically there at Rome's uh, desire to keep the peace. And by the way, this is not his normal residency. Pilate would live in Caesarea Maritima on the coast. He had a beautiful sea, seafront palace there. But he would come up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover because if there was ever a time where the Jewish people might try to revolt against Rome, it'll be during the Passover. Because remember in Exodus, Passover is commemorating a time where God overthrew a Gentile overlord. So in their mind, it's like, we got to keep the peace. So Pilate would come up for this feast to make sure. And so bringing Jesus to him as a potential insurrectionist would obviously get Pilate's attention. Like, who is this guy? So as we look at this, they're in the, the, the praetorium, they're in Pilate's residence, and it's the soldiers of the governor. Now, this is his elite guard. This is his own personal bodyguard. We think of, uh, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, you think of the Praetorian Guard there. Well, this is sort of a version of that for the governor. He would have his own security detail to protect him, obviously. The Jews hated him. Um, and, I, and there's a lot I could talk about Pilate. I'll save it for another time with you guys. But, but Pilate basically would make sure that his own personal safety was secure. And they bring Jesus into the Praetorium, into his private residence, this palace area. And notice what, what Matthew tells us. They gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Now, in your sanctified imagination, folks, I don't know how you think about this. Maybe you think it's a couple dozen soldiers there. A cohort is over 600 Roman soldiers. When they arrested Jesus at Gethsemane, again, if you run in your sanctified imagination, you probably have you know, Judas going along with maybe a dozen or two soldiers. No, 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 no. There was over 600 Roman soldiers with it. Why? Because they are afraid, if word got out that this popular rabbi was arrested, they would have a major riot on their hands. Hundreds of thousands welcomed him a few days earlier in Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. We cannot risk a riot. So this cohort is already up. They're already moving around. They've arrested Jesus. Now they're coming in, this cohort of 600 Roman soldiers, along with Pilate's own personal security detail now begin making fun of Jesus. He's been handed over to crucifixion. So what they do is they strip him and put him in a scarlet robe. All right. Now, remember that when Herod Antipas had interviewed Jesus, Luke records, for this, records this for us. When, when Herod Antipas interviewed Jesus, he gives him this beautiful, Luke says, a gorgeous scarlet robe. Just be aware, folks, color in this world is very expensive. There are two things that are very rare. Scent, like a perfume that's expensive. You think of the story of being poured out on Jesus for his burial. And colors. It was a very drab world, let's just put it that way. Color was expensive, dyes were expensive. So Herod gives him this gorgeous colored scarlet robe, and the, the soldiers they put, they strip him first of his clothes and put the scarlet robe on him. And then after twisting together a crown of thorns. Now, this is very familiar to us. They kind of put together. And by the way, in Jerusalem, if we're there and I could show this to you, all around the city, there's a small little weed that grows that has these thorns. They're pretty sure this is the bush that was used. If I find one, I'll show it to you. And they have needles on there. These thorns are about this long. It's not like a rose bush. These are big, heavy thorns. And I would imagine when they put that thing on Jesus' head, they weave that thing together and they just sort of, boom, slam it down on his head, driving those thorns. That itself would be excruciatingly painful. Believe me, I've run up against these things on hikes with shorts on. I wouldn't want somebody driving that onto my head. So they create this crown of thorns and they begin mocking him. Look what they do. Verse 29, they twist this crown of thorns, they put it on his head, they take the reed, they put it in his right hand, kind of treating it like a scepter, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, 
saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, we've been going through Matthew for two, about two years now. What is the theme of the book of Matthew? Jesus as King. Yeah, see how that's working out for you now, Jesus, King of the Jews. You're ours to play with now. As they mock him, they're spitting on him, a sign of, of, of disrespect. They take the reed that he was, they had him using as a scepter. They begin beating him with it. They mock him. They take his scarlet robe off of him. They put his own garments back on him and then lead him away to crucify him. Now, folks, the crucifixion, and I think this is important for next week when Matt's back and he will teach the second half of this. Scholars divide the crucifixion into two three-hour parts. The eyewitnesses in the Gospels are very clear about times. Jesus, it says, will go to the cross at the third hour. Now, that's third hour from sunrise, which is about 6 a.m. this time of year. Third hour to be about 9 o'clock in the morning. So Jesus will go up on the cross around 9 then the gospel writers are very careful. You're going to see this when Matt gets to it on verse 45. When the sixth hour comes, this would be noon on our calendars, there is this unnatural, unholy darkness that falls upon the earth. Something supernatural is about to occur. And I'll save that for Matt. I, I like to say, if any of you guys have lived in the Midwest and you've seen thunderstorms, you've gone outside, you know what this looks like. I'll never forget one time I was living in Dallas and I walked outside from my class and my, my dorm area was about maybe a quarter mile away. I remember looking up at the sky and it was green. And the sky was twisting, if you know what I mean. Like, oh my, this, something's about to happen here. And so I beat my feet and by the time I got back to my dorm, it unleashed and it filled a gutter in less than three minutes. Only if that would happen in California right now, right? You know, we could use that, but you know, you get my point. Something unnatural is happening. This, this is something to pay attention to. And so usually scholars, as they think about the first three hours, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of conversations on the cross. The other gospel writers tell us that Jesus will entrust his mother Mary to John. There's some dialogues that are occurring, forgiveness happening. Um, but then after, after noon, things change dramatically. And again, I don't want to steal Matt's thunder. Uh, that's his text next week, and I'll respect that. Christ will die at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour. So what we're looking at here largely is focusing on the first three hours. Matthew is giving us a glimpse in this text of what's happening before noon. So Jesus is taken off to crucify. We don't have the physical details of his particular cross, um, but what we do know about it, he would be crucified by being hung on the cross. He would be in agonizing pain. Let's remember he had been up all night because of the trials. The last meal he had was probably the Passover meal. The last drink or beverage he had was probably at that meal. He has been physically and verbally abused. He has been scourged with a Roman cat of nine, the flagrum. And now in absolute excruciating pain, he will be nailed to this wooden cross. Now with that in view, on the way, they, they lead him out. Look at verse 31. They mock him. They take his robe away from him. They probably kept it for themselves because it was worth a lot of money. I jokingly say they sold it on eBay. And lead him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon who they pressed into service to bear his cross. Now, it was possible... And this happened occasionally. Usually the Romans would make you bear your own cross, particularly the cross beam. You had to carry it. And these usually weren't light. If the person was incapable of carrying it, they could point somebody in the crowd and say, you, carry this. And that's what happens here. Now, what's interesting about Simon of Cyrene, now sometimes we blast through these Bible names. We don't ever do a little research on them. It's interesting in Mark's gospel, when he records the same account, he makes an observation, and remember, Mark is writing the Gospel of Mark to Romans. He makes the observation for the Roman church that Simon is the father 
of Alexander and Rufus. You know, why does that matter? Well, if you're in the Roman church, go back and read Romans 16. Rufus is mentioned in that list. This is a relative. You know this guy. Probably there for the feast. So the Romans will press Simon to carry his cross to the site, a distance of approximately maybe, I could walk it in maybe eight, nine minutes. Okay, they take him to where they will crucify him. Now that takes us to verse 33. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Okay, now this was a place of previous execution. Now, I get asked this question regularly, so let me just try to answer it now. Okay. There are a lot of sites, you read in Bible commentaries, there's a lot of sites that have been proposed for the, the crucifixion site of Jesus Christ. One of those is, is at the spot where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher today resides in Jerusalem. There's another spot called the Garden Tomb on the north side of the city, uh, identified by uh, uh, Cyrus Gordon, a British military officer, uh, who was actually sitting at the home of Horatio Spafford, who wrote It's Well With My Soul. And he happened one day to be having tea with the Spaffords, looked across the, the hill, noticed a hill that looked like a skull, and thought, hey, there, there, you know, there, that might be the spot, and went over there, checked it out, and found a tomb, which is not surprising. Any direction you go in Jerusalem, you're going to find a tomb. Believe me. And identified it, and the British Garden Society bought it up. And so you have visitors to Israel that will say, well, is it the Garden Tomb, or is it Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and there's been some other proposed sites. Well, let me settle the debate. You know, we could talk about it more if you want to privately, but it would, the more correct site is Church of the Holy Sepulchre, even though it's not the best place to commemorate this event. I always warn people when we go in, it's like, this is not going to give you the feel that you would like. It's what I call smells and bells. A lot of incense. Uh, definitely not what we would like to think of as we commemorate this critical event to our own Christian life. And so Jesus would be taught, taught took this place of execution. It's right outside the city walls. Uh, there's a major gate that ran past it. Um, people would be passing in and out of the city, and they would see these three victims. Now, notice that Matthew also records for us here, verse 34, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, or actually myrrh. Okay, a, a fragrance. Uh, what this was, was a way of, it was sort of a, a way of, uh, it was an act of mercy. It was a way of maybe um, desensitizing the person a little bit. Uh, kind of like giving them an aspirin, I suppose we might say today, or something that may take the edge off the pain a little bit. Uh, when Jesus tastes it, realize what it is, he won't touch it. He wants to have his full senses for this. He wants nothing to, he wants the full experience. So he refuses it. Now that was common. They would often do this. Okay, we'll give you a little bit. Take the edge off for now, but you're going to die up there. And they sit down and begin to keep watch over there. Okay, look at verse 36. Now I think it's interesting here that this is recorded for us. They kind of sit down and wonder what's going to happen. This is a guy that was a miracle worker. This is a guy who had healed many. This is a guy who had raised the dead. This is a guy, we think of all the miracles we've read about in Matthew's gospel, particularly chapters 8 to 10. This is obviously an unusual person. Let's see what's going to happen. And they sit down and watch. Now let's keep going. Verse 37. And above his head, they put up the charge against him. Now, this was common. So it's called a titulus. Whenever a person was executed by Rome, on their cross would be not only the person's name, but also be the charge that they were being executed for. In Jesus' case, it's interesting, it's recorded, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now what I find interesting, and you guys read in the other Gospel writers, the other Gospels tell us Pilate put that up there and the, the chief priest didn't like it. They want to change it, say, well, put, he, he said he was. I think Pilate, in sort of a way of getting back at them, says, I put down what I put down, deal with it. That's my paraphrase. So the, the titulus, this title over Jesus, this is what he is being crucified for. And let me just say, uh, brothers and sisters, I hear people say this all the time, and I just cringe when I hear them say it, that Jesus was, die, Jesus was crucified for being an insurrectionist. No, he was not. If he was crucified for being an insurrectionist, he was a criminal, which means there is something fundamentally flawed in him. He was not a criminal. 
he was executed for being the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's very clear. Okay, and again, I don't want to cover terrain that Matt really well covered last week, but that's exactly why he would die. So they have this titulus up there, he dies for being king of the Jews. Now we know the story, look at verse 38. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now we know that, okay? I always think of the, I always think of the account with James and John where they send their mom up to Jesus. You talk about the original helicopter parent, you know? Mom goes up to Jesus, hey look, my boys, when you get to your kingdom, you set your kingdom up in Jerusalem, they're on their way up to Jerusalem, Jericho. When you set that kingdom up, put my, boy, my boys on your right and left. When it comes down to it, who's on Jesus' right and left? Two robbers. Not James and John. These two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now look at verse 39. Let's kind of tease this out as we're getting near the end here. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him. Literally the word hurling there, guys, is the idea of blasphemous. They were blaspheming him. And wagging their heads, a sign of just absolute shaming him. Again, we don't get this in our modern Western culture. The guy that was the, guy that was the, the triumphal king of Sunday is now an object of derision on Friday. Shaking the head, yeah, what kind of king did you turn out to be? Verse 40, they were saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In other words, going back to the first Passover, Jesus taught, Mick, this is even mentioned in John's gospel. Uh, John in, um, there talks about this in John chapter 2, verses 19 and following. Uh, it's interesting all the way, by the way, even in Matthew's gospel, if your memory's good, you remember back a chapter or two ago in Matthew 26, they were trying to bring the charge, this charge against Jesus. He said he would destroy the temple and bring it, bring it back in three days. So if you can do that, if you, Jesus, can do that, you're on this Roman cross, we know everybody that goes up on a Roman cross comes off a Roman cross dead. If you can really do that, pull yourself off it. If you're really the Son of God, do that. And Jesus is quiet. Folks, as I read this myself, I think of all the people I've encountered over my life who they will taunt God and say, hey, if you're really God, show me a sign, and I'll believe. In fact, I think the more correct way to think is you believe, and then God will show you what he does in his providence and his working in your life. They taunt Jesus. Hey, if you're really who you claim to be, and, and folks, I don't want us to lose this idea of the Son of God. We are so, again, accustomed to that phraseology that we forget that when you claim to be son of God, you are claiming deity. You are claiming to be God himself. If you're really God, and that's why the blasphemy here, if you're really God, come off that cross. And man, we'll believe you in a second. But all of us understand who are sitting here that Jesus had to go to the cross because as John would say, John the Baptist would say, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Before there can be a political solution, there must be a spiritual solution. Before you deal with the problems in society, you've got to deal with the root of the problem of society, which is sin. Christ had to pay the substitutionary price for you and for me on that cross. So no, he's not going to come down. That has to happen. Now in verse 41, as we move towards the end of this, the scene changes slightly. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. And notice, this is not a qualified statement. It's not if he is the king of Israel. Notice your text there. It says, he is the king of Israel. Hey, this guy says he's the king. He's the king. If you're the king, notice this. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. Prove it. 
Again, they're, not, they're thinking political here. They're not thinking spiritual. Jesus, you claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. You come off that cross, we'll believe it. Now, as we wrap this up, folks, let's look at the last part of it here. They quote Psalm 22. Look at verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. In other words, they understood the Messianic prophecies, that God would deliver his chosen one, his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. So if you are, let's see God deliver you, and we'll believe that. Reason? Look at the end of verse 43. For he said, I am the Son of God. He claimed deity. And by the way, John's gospel is full of claims of deity. I won't even begin to touch that with you here. I mean, there's so much I'd like to say, but time, obviously, you guys want to have a day, so I want to be sensitive to that. But he claimed to be God. When people say to me, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, I say, what Bible are you reading? It's all over. To say son of God is to say that you are God. They understood that. If you'll come off that cross, we'll believe you. And then it wraps it up. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now, it's interesting with the robbers, guys. If you know your Bible well, you know there comes a point where one of these robbers thinks better of the whole idea. And he realizes, having watched Jesus on this cross, get this uh, verbal abuse hurled at him and taking it. Forgiving his crucifiers. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. This man observing that says, this guy is in fact the Son of God. And says, as you know from the other gospel writers, Matthew doesn't have it written in his account, but the other gospel writers, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. So he thinks better, sort of a cross confession here, of his own abuse of this person. Now, folks, as we wrap this up today and we think about application of this, how do you apply this? I want to give you two things to think about, guys, and I really do mean this. As we take these lessons here from the cross, there are two passages of Scripture that really resonate in my mind, and one of those Charlie read earlier, and that's Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles... Here, keep your finger in in Matthew 27. Let's go back and look what what Charlie read earlier in Philippians chapter 2. Look at it with me. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Paul would write to the church at Philippi. Now, I want to remind you, Philippi was a Roman colony. This was occupied by Romans. This was a Roman retirement center. This is where people who had done military service with Rome, these are people that had had served the empire, served the emperor. This was sort of their version of Leisure Village. All right? These are people who understood crucifixion. And if you looked at the bulletin and you saw the quote from Cicero, Cicero said that, that the Roman cross was so horrendous, so horrific, that it shouldn't be on the mouth or the mind or the thought of any Roman citizen. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to write to a Roman colony these words. Have this attitude in yourselves. Now, some of you in your Bibles have mindset or have this mental attitude in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is something, folks, that you and I are called by the Apostle Paul to emulate. Who, though, Although he existed in the form, the very essence of God, he was God himself in flesh, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He divested himself of the glory of heaven to come to earth to dwell among sinful men. And let me tell you, that's a bummer. And notice this, he takes on the essence or form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death. Now, Paul could have stopped right there, but I think adding these words would have really rung in the ears 
of a Roman citizen. Even death on a cross, guys. The very thing that you put out of your mind, it's so horrific, you need to have the attitude, I need to have the attitude that we need to be able to do the same thing. The God who created the wood that he hung on died on that cross. The God who created all things and upholds them with the word of his power humbled himself to die for you and I. If anything, the cross should change our attitude. Paul tells us, have this attitude, have this mindset in you to humble yourself. Now, the second passage, go back to Matthew 27, and I want you to go back over one chapter to 26 here. Okay, and I got the, get the last slide up here. I'm sorry, Matthew 16. I'm not 26. I think it's 16. 16, I said 26. Let's go back to Matthew 16. We forget this. Matthew 16. Look at verse 24. Jesus, by the way, had just revealed his death. This would have been scandalous to his disciples. They thought he was going to set up this political millennial kingdom. Peter, of course, rebukes him. You remember we studied this. Peter rebukes him for that. And Jesus says these words, verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In fact, it's interesting, the other gospel writers insert the word daily there. In other words, every day, the action I need to do as a believer, and let me tell you, folks, I struggle with this. I'll just confess that to you now. I, I know it, I understand it, I teach it, and I struggle with it, like most people do, is I have to put myself aside and say it's not about me. And I live in a culture, especially American culture, where it's all about self. It is not. You deny yourself. You take up your cross. You are now a dead man walking. And you follow me with that. Now, that doesn't sell in most Christian circles today. That wants to sell. If you pick up most Christian magazines, you read Christian books, listen to Christian speakers, Christianity is this cozy little thing. We like to embrace it with grace. We like to make it uh, tea cozy with our Bible studies or devotional books and make it something comfortable. And understand, no, it's not. Every day I have to get up. I have to deny myself, say it's not about me. I have to pick up my cross, say, okay, Lord, and by the way, that cross is not a mere inconvenience. I think too often we see, well, you know, I just, there's traffic on the way to work or whatever. No, that's not what we're talking about here. I have to die to myself. Again, I like books. You guys will figure that out with me real quick. Occasionally, my students will ask me, Dr. Beely, what's the most significant book you've read? I always say the Bible, and they go, oh, yeah, 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 we're going to do that. I said, okay, if you really want to know the most significant book I've read in the last 10 years, and I, I warned them, I said, don't read this book because you probably won't be able to handle it, is Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which is a masterful, powerful expose on the rise of self in Western culture. It's all about me. And Christianity is against that. It stands against that. It says it's not about you. It's not. A, your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. It is not I in Galatians 2.20 that live. It's Christ in me. It's about Jesus Christ. So when I think of the cross, I have to think daily of picking that cross up, dying to self, and moving forward. And I do that every day. And I'll be honest with you guys, some days I don't do very well with that. Kelly's sitting here, she can tell you. She's shaking her head, yeah. <laughs> right? So folks, as we think about an event that we're all familiar with the crucifixion, do we have an attitude that we are willing to put self aside, to become a servant of others, even to the point, even to the point of the horrific death on this cross? Do we, set, do we deny ourselves, set self aside daily, 
That's our challenge from the Word of God today. Now, next week, when Matt comes back, he will finish up the crucifixion. He'll take you from noon to death. Um, a lot happens. There's a lot. I mean, all of history hinges on that three hours of time. It is powerful, folks. You don't want to miss it. As Christ will suddenly goes quiet up until the very end of his life and says those masterful words, it is finished, done. I have accomplished salvation for humanity through my death. And folks, we live for that as believers in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we wrap up today and we end with a few uh, songs, I just ask that as we think about an event that is so familiar to all of us, particularly those of us that are older in the faith, Father, let us never lose the power of this event, what Christ did for us, the pain, the physical and spiritual pain and separation that he went through in the six hours of human history. Father, may we never forget it. Lord, be with Matt and Brandy today. Be with this church as we launch off into the various activities that we will do. I pray you would bless everyone here this week. In Christ's name, amen. you stand with me as we sing. I'd like to lead you in a song that my kids and I have been singing uh, at breakfast together. And for some of you, this will, might be a new song. And for some of you, this will be a very old song. <laughs> it goes like this. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden
Well, I don't know about you, but a lot to respond to there today, isn't it? Maybe you're here and you've known the Lord for many years um, and you can just give thanks and reflect. Maybe you're here and you've never bowed before Christ. You've never known him. Don't let this day go by without seeking his face, bowing before him. In fact, we have a prayer team and a prayer room over here. If you have that need on your heart or other things, please take advantage of that. They'd love to pray with you, whether it be something about today's service or anything in your life. And um, with that, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you. We really can't thank you enough except for the to just offer our lives daily to have that attitude in our lives every day as you had as you humbled yourself. May we do that today in your power and thank you for the great love that you have that you sacrificed yourself that we would be right with you. Thank you, Father. May we go from here rejoicing, filled with thanksgiving over what you've done in us and through us and for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Bye.